Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody for the Polkadot and Substrate for Beginners talk. Uh, like Anastasia, uh, you know, introduced, I'm Radha Dasari. I'm a technical educator at Web3 Foundation. So I'll be speaking for the first half of this presentation, followed by Sacha, who's from Parity Technologies. Uh, a brief introduction about myself. Um, I, before joining Web3 Foundation, I was a computer science educator at the University of Vermont. Um, I did my PhD in computer science from, you know, University at Buffalo uh, in New York. All right, so uh, I'm gonna make few claims in this slide, and then uh, we're gonna talk about each of these claims later on when we go into the talk. So Polkadot is a foundational building block of the new web, right? So we're trying to uh, redesign the, the internet as is uh, how it works right now. And we want to enable people, enterprises and governments to be, you know, uh, to be out there and doing their work without having to trust a third party, right? So we want to enable this motto of ours. Uh, it's less trust, more truth. Um, and how we achieve that is, is what, you know, this talk is going to focus on. So the two organizations behind Polkadot are Web3 Foundation. Uh, right now I'm, I'm at the main office of Web3 Foundation. We're we are stationed in Zug, Switzerland. Uh, we're about like 50 employees. Uh, whereas Parity, uh, where Sacha works, it's uh, about the size of 150 employees. They are based in Berlin, Germany. Okay, so talking about Polkadot. Okay, so Polkadot, what is Polkadot, right? So you hear about a lot of blockchains that are out there and you also may have heard about this, uh, you know, terminology saying one is layer zero, layer one, layer two. Um, so Polkadot is a layer zero blockchain. Uh, by layer zero, uh, being a layer zero, it can support a lot of layer one blockchains. Okay, so in this figure, uh, all of these, um, you know, uh, blocks that you see here, they are basically ind individual sovereign blockchains, you know, which are connected to the relay chain, which is Polkadot. So the terminology we use for, for these blockchains is parachains. And the reason we do it is because parachains run parallelly with the actual, you know, relay chain. Uh, th that is what Polkadot is. So a couple of things, uh, parachains are going to share uh, the security uh, that is offered by the relay chain. And also they'll be able to communicate with each other um, once Polkadot goes live fully. So that brings us to the next topic, but when will Polkadot be live? Okay, so Polkadot network launch. As you can see, we are fairly a uh, new project. Uh, we launched last May, last year, May, Although like the work on, on this project started much early, like in 2017. So May, 2020, that's when the first block of the relay chain, um, you know, that, that came into existence. And then uh, we have a consensus uh, protocol that uh, is proof, proof of authority based. Uh, and then in June, we, we switched to nominated proof of stake. So I'll be going over what this term exactly means later on. Um, and in July, we basically removed the, the authority, you know, so there's no single person who will be, you know, controlling the whole chain. So the, uh, we handed over uh, the governance to the dot, dot holders, the ones who already have, have the tokens. Um, in August, 2020, balance transfers are enabled. So what this means is if you have some tokens, some dots, you'll be able to transfer them to, to other accounts on the network. And ever since that, uh, till today, so the network has, has just been doing that. And then, and then there have been lots of code upgrades in between, but the core functionality of the network uh, has been just this. So uh, what happened here? So I'm gonna try to explain that in a bit. But yeah, so here is like a live snapshot of uh, the Polkadot relay chain. As you can see, the target block speed. So Polkadot is a blockchain, right? So blocks keep getting added and they're glued together as, as a chain. 
So every six seconds, uh, you have a new block, you know, joining the blockchain. So here you can see that, you know, currently we have about 6 million blocks on the blockchain. Uh, this is the hash of, of that particular block. And this is the validator who validated that particular block. A um, couple of other things I want to highlight here. Um, right, so, so the best block and the finalized block. Okay, so finalized block is actually finalized. And you know, this, this, it's not going to be reverted from, from the blockchain. Uh, so that is here. It always trails the best block that is already created and, and sitting out there in the network. And if you focus on, on the events that are happening on, on the blockchain, like I mentioned, most of them are balances related, right? So balance transfers, um, you know, balances just lost or, or whatever. And the other key thing that I want to, you know, show to you, uh, this is where like lots of community is invested in, um, you know, in, in the project. So it's the uh, staking functionality. Uh, so staking essentially secures the whole network. Uh, I'm gonna explain to you when I get to the topic of staking, but know that there are, uh, you know, about like 21,000 uh, nominators. The nominators are the ones who hold dots uh, as network tokens. They're going to stake them uh, over validators. Okay, so there are uh, 297 active validators who are actively, you know, validating the blocks on, on, on the network. Uh, and then there are 651 validators that are waiting to get into the active set. So it's, it's, it's a big community. As you can see, a lot of people are participating in, in securing the network. And also like Polkadot uh, blockchain, uh, the tokens are inflationary, meaning more and more tokens get produced uh, as, as a reward. When, when somebody creates a block, uh, there's, the block is going to be associated with the uh, block reward. Um, yeah, so feel free to to open this website that I've linked there. You can explore, uh, you know, the on-chain uh, parameters of, of Polkadot by yourself. And here is a, a small snapshot of, of validators doing their work. Uh, so where, as you can see, all these uh, dots that you see here uh, represent like validator nodes. Uh, we are geographically distributed, uh, you know, closing towards our objective of becoming a decentralized uh, blockchain project. All right, so yeah. So coming back to the topic of our network launch, uh, right now Polkadot has no parachains on it. Then where exactly is all the action? Like what have we been doing for, for the past like one year? Uh, the answer for that is, is this, Kusama. So Kusama is, is uh, basically Polkadot's canary network. Uh, some may call it like test network, but you know, it's not just a test network. It, it has like real economic value. Uh, as some of you may have heard, uh, um, there are like parachain auctions that are live at this moment. Like they're going on uh, on Kusama relay chain. Uh, so as of now, all of the listed parachains here are plugged into um, you know, the Kusama relay chain. Uh, so let me back down a little bit and talk about what Kusama Relay Chain is all about. Um, so Kusama Relay Chain is the Polkadot's canary network. So, so this term canary uh, refers to the bird, uh, which is Kusama's like logo. Um, so canary birds were used, um, you know, a couple of centuries ago when people were uh, digging up coal mines, they wanted to test whether the mine is safe for people or not. Okay, so they used to take that that bird inside and and check if, if the bird is healthy, and and that's when they they uh, start their work. So drawing a similar parallel to to our ecosystem, so Kusama is the uh, chain where pretty much the code of Kusama and Polkadot are going to be the same. Whatever changes happen, they'll first be tested on Kusama relay chain. Okay, so it. Uh, it exists for uh, for this reason, uh, but I'm I'm gonna back down again uh, and and talk about how independent both of these chains are in a bit. Um, again, like I said, both 
Polkadot and Kusama host uh, mostly the same code, um, but like I mentioned, Kusama already has these parachains plugged in. So that's why you see lots of events here uh, are related to like, like parachains that are plugged in. Okay, so it's pretty much the, uh, a similar blockchain. You know, it has like six seconds block uh, production time. Um, the total number of tokens are, are different, but that's okay. Uh, the core technology that powers Kusama is, is the core technology that powers Polkadot as well. And Sacha will, will go over the topic. Um, so the core technology that powers both of them is, is Substrate. All right, so uh, Kusama again has uh, an active decentralized community. As you can see there are, Kusama has like even more validators, like you have 900 active validators, uh, but fewer like nominators who are staking on the system. Um, yeah, and the inflation rate of, of Kusama is, is this, as of now, it, it gets adjusted, you know, according to the total number of tokens that are staked, which is a different topic altogether. Uh, feel free to check this out on Polka.js website as well. All right, so uh, comparing these cousin networks. Okay, so so why do we need two different things? The first use case was something that I introduced earlier. So we want to be able to test, um, you know, the applications on on a, a chain with some real economic value. Uh, and yeah, so Kusama is, is a place where uh, you can innovate in a faster way. Why uh, Kusama is, is an independent chain. It has its own governance and that governance is faster than the governance on, on Polkadot. So Polkadot is more conservative network where you, you want things to deliberately move slower, right? So you want stability uh, to host like enterprise level applications. Uh, you don't want breaking changes that are going to affect the stability of the applications you deploy on Polkadot. So that's the objective of Polkadot, whereas Kusama, you expect chaos. So by design, Kusama is, is meant to be uh, chaotic, meaning uh, a lot of people are going to test a lot of applications on, on Kusama, and, and few of them may have some effect on, on the relay chain, but, but that's part of Kusama's like objective. So it's, it's great for bold experimentation and early stage uh, uh, deployment. Okay, so uh, yeah, here is a slide that, that shows you exactly like what's going on with, with Polkadot and what's going on with Kusama. Um, like I mentioned, Polkadot, the benefits are, uh, you know, it, it offers very high stability, high security, uh, and also the validators who are validating on Polkadot are going to um, have like higher rewards okay, for securing uh, this particular network. And the use cases are below. So if you're a developer and, and you're looking for, um, you know, developing an application that falls in this bracket, your target should be to become a parachain or, you know, be on a parachain uh, on Polkadot, okay? Uh, whereas Kusama, okay, so uh, there are low barriers for entry. Okay, so the entry barrier is, is uh, lower than the entry barrier of Polkadot, uh, fast iteration, faster governance. So here are the use cases for, for Kusama. Um, yeah, so early stage startup, you're trying to experiment with an idea, checking whether you know, that's gonna work in, in Polkadot ecosystem or not. Uh, you'll deploy that, that application on, on Kusama as a parachain or as an application on an existing parachain on Kusama. And yeah, so these are not the, I mean, as a developer, you won't directly go to Kusama and, and you know, uh, put a lot of money uh, into it. Uh, I, what I mean to say is as a developer in Polkadot ecosystem, you have other test nets as well with no economic value. Um, so one is like Westend, uh, which has the core functionality of, of, of what's deployed on Polkadot. So that's way, that way you, you can test out your, your applications. Um, and Rococo is, is more of an experimental um, you know, test net, which is going to test advanced features that are to be deployed on, onto the networks. So if you're a developer, and if you're interested in, in entering Polkadot ecosystem, you would be uh, you know, looking at these uh, test networks first, 
after your your application works well your your parachain will will go further and be plugged into to kusama through what we call parachain auctions all right so um all right so let me let me uh, give you even a broader overview of what polkadot um, goals are and and what its features are supposed to be once the network launches fully the first key feature of polkadot is is you know connecting networks together so polkadot tries to be this internet of blockchains uh, how do we connect like different blockchains together uh, earlier i talked about polkadot being like layer zero blockchain so let's look at what layer one blo blockchains are so bitcoin you can consider that as a layer one blockchain it is really good at doing one thing that that it does which is being a distributed ledger okay so being this secure distributed ledger um so bitcoin is like a l1 layer one blockchain so it has a specific objective and it it fulfills that similarly you can have a, a bitcoin style uh, blockchain that can be built on top of polkadot so just to give you a perspective and also you can have a layer one blockchain like ethereum so ethereum can do much more than than you know what bitcoin does so you can build custom applications or you know decentralized applications on top of ethereum and you call them like layer two if, if you're implementing as a as a blockchain it's a layer two blockchain um yeah so on layer one blockchains you can you know build uh, more on top of it and ethereum is one of the blockchains that allows l1 blockchains that allows you to do it so point being you, you know so in polkadot you would have seen this logo many times uh, all these individual you know boxes that you see right here so blocks that you see right right there represent an individual blockchain and that can have its own like you know uh, use case or, or application a few examples i've listed here um, you know internet of things finance insurance gaming uh, identity identity and so on and so forth um, and this diversity in terms of like applications can be seen in kusama parachain auctions as well so a lot of the parachain teams that you see um, that are bidding and, and winning the uh, parachain auction slots uh, they are already very diverse and and they encompass like these um, use cases yeah so the job is to have all these parachains plugged into like this polkadot relay chain and uh, assisting all of these blockchains to you know seamlessly interact with each other benefiting from each other's features and and having the security guaranteed by the polkadot relay chain network yeah so uh, and also so not only this but you can also interact with uh, blockchains that are outside Pol polkadot ecosystem for instance like bitcoin ethereum um, and and you know other uh, blockchains which which are built on their own um, you know design principle and and technology so these bridges can also be built um, and one of the first bridges that is that is um, uh, going to be the focus of, of polkadot ecosystem is bridging these two relay chains like kusama and and polkadot um, how do these chains in, interact with each other uh, it's an interesting uh, problem and it's in a, it's an interesting feature right so two two individual blockchains that are trying to communicate with each other so so this is a possibility too so you'll be able to interact with applications which are sitting on on ethereum uh, while you know your blockchain itself is deployed on on polkadot yeah so the other thing is uh, enabling custom made platforms built for specific apps so the point being uh, like i mentioned not every blockchain solves uh, you know every kind of problem so you need blockchains that are uh, tailored to solve a specific problem uh, it's more or less like you being a dj or or you know uh, given a song you need to like equalize it to, to give a good experience for for the listeners so uh, that's what uh, you know substrate does so substrate is is the 
framework that is that is powering Polkadot as as well as other chains that are plug, plugging into the Polkadot relay, ch relay chain. So the way it works is you have this framework and it's more or, more or less like, like Lego, uh, you know, so you have a bunch of Lego blocks, you can build any sort of structure the, that you'd like to, right? So by customizing like the blocks that you want to include, uh, for instance, you know, you want to uh, include like a governance uh, palette, palette is what, what we call it. Uh, Sacha is going to explain them in more detail. So here you have this balances uh, palette. You're, you can plug that in as well. And it's more of like a plug and play, like blockchain um, framework, right? So it's going to make your life uh, easy and, and it lets you focus on your own application and, and do what, what you want to do the best. Okay? So instead of worrying about the security aspect of, of the blockchain, you're going to build the application um, that you'd like to build. Uh, so uh, a simple slide that shows you how, you know, you have a bunch of options to choose from. Uh, you can <clears throat> you can decide uh, what palette you need for your blockchain. Um, just uh, take it and, and build, build this particular runtime with all those palettes. So uh, as a developer, it's going to make your life uh, a lot easier. So uh, you can get kickstart. You can kickstart your project pretty fast. All right. So handling heavy traffic at scale. So uh, just to you know compare Web three and Web two. So Polkadot is, is Web three, right? This is what we're trying to build. Uh, so Visa, uh, it's it's uh, it's a common name on on your your credit cards. Uh, they have to like validate a lot of transactions, like every second throughout the globe. Um, and this is the capacity that, that they can achieve with, with that, you know, uh, even they have like cloud servers uh, distributed across, across the globe. Uh, this is the capacity that, that they've been reaching. And with our architecture of, you know, parallel chains running uh, along with the relay chain, uh, we can, you know, theoretically hit, hit these many levels of transactions per second. Uh, a lot of stress tests have have already been done, and as as parachains go go live, you would see, uh, you know, this this theoretical number uh, coming into into fruition. So Polkadot, by design with its architecture, can handle plenty of transactions at, at the scale, um, and that's one of the main features for having these parachains connected to a relay chain. All right, so revolutionizing online governance. Uh, yeah, so governance is one of the key aspects of a blockchain, right? So who decides what changes have to happen uh, in, in the way this blockchain uh, is run or, you know, how the blocks uh, get created, that that part, you know, that power, uh, it, it it's uh, vested in the community. Um, that that is what Polkadot does. This third option, the community proposes and votes on on the decisions that impact the network's future in terms of it, its technology, in terms of its its use cases. All of that is is decided by this decentralized community. Uh, but just to give you an example, there are blockchains that are out there with no governance, so nobody has any say about what you know how what changes need to be made regarding that blockchain or its network parameters, it, it runs as is, and uh, you can either choose to be in, in that community or, or you, know, you, you don't have much choice there. And there is this benevolent dictator model where only one person or, or like one entity is going to decide what the future of that particular blockchain is. Um, yeah, so, so this is where Polkadot uh, you know, is, is working to to get to uh, a decentralized community that's going to decide the fate of the network. Yeah, and already on, on Polkadot network or Kusama, you can see that, that the democracy is activated. Uh, people can propose referendums. Uh, this follows closely the, you know, the democracy procedure that we have at Switzerland. Um, you know, people can, anybody can, can propose a, a referendum. Uh, it goes to vote, and and there are different ways in which people can vote. Like uh, so, there is also a 
weight based voting, a conviction voting, where if you uh, bond your tokens for a longer time, your vote gets you know a, a more weight. Uh, all of these features are are kept there to to make sure uh, the community is diverse and even like minorities get get to have a get to have a say in 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 the network's like future. So there's also a council and and yeah. So if you go to the polka.js a website that I've shown earlier. If you just click on the governance drop down, you you see all these options. So we have the democracy. That's where the referendums uh, sit. And then there's the council. It lists all the council uh, members who are voted and and are part of the council. There is treasury, so you can have proposals funded through the treasury, right? So there have been multiple proposals that are already funded by Kus Kusama Treasury that are helping like like the Polkadot ecosystem grow. Uh, you can also suggest like bounties for for people. Let's say somebody is working like really hard to to improve the ecosystem. Uh, you can you can have the bounties there, and then and then people can can vote for for that. Uh, yeah. So from governance to uh, execution. So uh, as you can see, it's not like somebody votes on on something and people will work on it and then you know, uh, put that across. So uh, this, all of this can, can happen almost in, in real time. Like you can already have the software upgrade uh, ready-made plugged into to the referendum that, that you create. So, so Polkadot uh, nodes run software, uh, you know, which, which in turn runs a blob of VASM code. <clears throat> so, so this can be deployed right after the, the referendum Passes. So, so basically, your uh, governance is going to let once people vote for for the network to be modified, the code gets automatically deployed on the network, and and the network uh, changes. But yeah, so these are the goals of of what we try to achieve, um, or at least we're we're targeting to achieve uh, ability to to make good decisions, coherence, security scalability and preserving decentralized qualities. Okay, so no party should be privileged over another a priori. Um, yeah, so this is, these are the goals, like ambitious goals that Polkadot is, is going to focus on and then, and then you know, achieve uh, in the future. Industry leading security. So yeah, uh, like I mentioned, as a, a blockchain, developer uh, in Polkadot ecosystem, your focus can be on, you know, just coding the application that you want to be deployed on, on Polkadot. So uh, the security as aspect of it can be guaranteed by the relay chain. So how does this security work? Uh, it is powered by this nominated proof of stake, uh, you know, mechanism where Polkadot is secured by the economic power of the DOT token itself, meaning there are a bunch of nominators. So you saw that earlier on Polkadot, there are about 20,000 nominators right now, all of them holding some number of DOTs. So they are going to nominate, trust their, their tokens uh, on a validator. So a validator is the person who is going to create the block for, for the Polkadot network. So you're, the way this works is you want you want the trustworthy validators to get like more stake, right? So so the whole network is is designed in such a way that malicious validators will get slashed, meaning the stake that that you put on those validators will get uh, penalized, and and you know people are gonna lose a value uh, from you know their nomination. So this in itself make sure this sort of you know uh, game theoretic uh, system makes sure that that the network is is secure um yeah i i saw a question in chat box um i'm i'm definitely going to take it like right after uh, i finish i should be finished in in like about 15 minutes okay uh all right so so that is 
yeah so that's how nominated proof of stake works uh, feel free to to check like our wiki page it's going to give you in-depth details of how this is achieved and the way we do it right now it's it's an engineering feat i think sacha can can explain more about that uh, polkadot has like one of the uh, complex like you know nomination and, and staking mechanisms out there and and definitely it's it's uh, it's worth looking uh, you know if if you're into computer science and want to solve like advanced problems, take a look at this graph problem and then you'll, you'll understand the complexity. And finally, like I mentioned, self upgrades. Like we want to convert what we have right here into this uh, just with, with like a governance vote, okay? So, and the way that is done is, uh, so Polkadot creates these blocks at some, some block this, this upgrade will happen and the upgrade code can change the network parameters or the network, uh, the relay chain code itself. Okay, so that's also something very impressive. Uh, we call that like forkless upgrade, meaning there is no forking that's going to happen when, when, when some features about this network change. Uh, which, which is different from, from legacy blockchain upgrades, right? So. Um, at, at this point, the network might get forked, it gets split. Uh, there are a bunch of like validators who, who are interested in this and a bunch of validators interested in that. So this wouldn't happen on, on Polkadot where the governance decides like what happens uh, with the blockchain. So once that vote passes, the features are, are automatically like upgraded on the network and without any, any forking, the, the block production goes uh, further and further um, after the upgrade. So summarizing what, what I've just, just mentioned, um, you know, there is lots of interoperability planned, uh, pooled security. So we want to provide uh, the security to uh, the parachains that are plugged into the relay chain. And the way we do it is by having these validators on the relay chain, you know, validating the blocks from the parachain. Okay, so so that way this this selection is like randomized. That way, no nobody can collude together in in targeting specific parachains or 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 the other. And yeah, so heterogeneous chains like each chain has has its own uh, like you know use case or, or application and a thought through governance. And this is something that that keeps. You know the governance itself can be changed through through the governance module, right? So you can you can decide uh, if something is wrong with the governance itself. Uh, technologically, with the technology, you, you're you're able to change that on the network on the on the blockchain. All right. So, given the time being, I'm I'm going to just skim through uh, the la last few slides that I have. I'm going to talk about uh, the Polkadot architecture. Um, so you heard me like talking about parachains. So parachain are the chains that, that run parallelly with the relay chain, but they're plugged in to the relay chain for the security. So, so parachain gets full security. It gets instant connectivity. It's almost like a hotline that is running between one blockchain, the blockchain, uh, the parachain and the relay chain. Uh, there is full throughput, meaning if parachain produces a block, it is guaranteed that that block is, is processed and included uh, by the relay chain, okay? So, so this is like the high quality of service that any, any blockchain project can get on either Kusama or Polkadot. The other option is to become a para thread. Like if you have, have a blockchain project and uh, you know, you need like full security, but you don't need this block production to happen uh, as frequently. Okay, so then uh, you should be able to be connect connected to the relay chain as well, uh, but you don't need this full throughput. Uh, you can auction for your block to be included by the relay chain through an auction process. Okay, so it will be per, plo per block basis. So you can actually pay uh, for that block to be included. Uh, and yeah, so, so this is for, for the blockchains that, that don't need like high throughput. Um, 
but yeah, so there is the polka dot allows you to switch between one one and the other. Uh, and this para thread implementation is is still in progress. Okay, so right now para chains are live on Kusama. Uh, but yeah, so the plan is to get these para threads para thread implementation in place as well pretty soon. And typically the architecture looks like this. So here we have the relay chain, which is Polkadot. We have these slots, which are visualized as, as these white blocks. Um, so there is a parachain slot. We have this sovereign parachain, which is doing its own work. Uh, we have what is called as a collator. So every parachain has a collator that collects the transactions that are happening in, in this particular blockchain and you know, send it to the relay chain where the validators like validate it. They validate the straight transition that's happening uh, within this, this blockchain and then make sure they, the parachain creates its blocks like seamlessly. Uh, so there are parachain slots which, which can, you know, ha um, which can uh, function as, as a bridge slot as well. So here, other blockchains, meaning blockchains like Ethereum or, or Bitcoin. So they are plugged into the relay chain through, through this particular slot. And here are like para threads. So you have a bunch of uh, blockchains that are subscribed as para threads. So they have uh, validators assigned. So individually they're going to, um, you know, put their blocks on, on, on the relay chain whenever they, they want to. So they'll be competing with, with others while they're auctioning for their block to be processed by the relay chain. Yeah, so shared security, how do we guarantee it? Um, so the verification and finalization of blocks is performed by the validators on the relay chain. And like I mentioned, even before launching of parachains, we already built this decentralized um, you know, network of validators and, and nominate, nominators. So we are counting on the decentralization to secure the whole ecosystem. And yes, here, here is one, one feature that is uh, the most anticipated. It's like cross-chain uh, message passing. So you want to pass message from one sovereign parachain to another sovereign parachain. Uh, and this message passing will, will happen through the relay chain, okay? So ideally, when the cross-chain message passing feature is fully implemented, uh, the messages themselves won't be stored on, on the relay chain blocks, okay? So, so the message is directly passed uh, from one parachain to the other. Um, just a hash of that is going to be stored. But as of now, uh, you know, if you go to Rococo and test uh, this, you'll see that the current protocol is, is cross-chain messaging, message passing light, where, you know, it, it puts the messages directly on the relay chain. Uh, so becoming a parachain, so uh, Polkadot and Kusama follow a process of auctions. Uh, there is a, a reason for, for doing this. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard of, you know, the initial coin offering schemes that, that you know, came into existence during 20, 2017 and 2018. Um, so auctions are, are meant to, to make sure that there is a secure way that people could, could participate in, in the growth of, of blockchain ecosystems, right? So, so what we use is, is called um, a candle auction, meaning we, the auction process starts and, and people start bidding their, their offers. Uh, think of it this way. So I have a candle and then I'm going to store it in, in a box. Um, me as the relay chain, I know when the candle, uh, you know, melts away and, and gets, you know, puts off. Um, but the bidding keeps happening. So I'll note down who has the highest bid when this candle was, was uh, you know, put off. So that would be the winner, but, but the bidders wouldn't know. Uh, they'll, they'll bid through, throughout that that's, uh, you know, auction duration. Uh, and once the auction ends, then uh, we're going to backtrack and, and look at where exactly uh, this candle was off and then declare the winner. So what this is going to ensure is uh, honest bid. Like if you feel like you need to have n number of tokens to secure the, the slot, you're going to be honest with your bid from the beginning uh, of this auction. Okay, so this is going to have like fair auctions um, 
uh, in the system. And as you can see, we, we published a, a report on Kusama Parachain Auctions 1. So we saw this, this method really worked. So this was devised by the researchers at Web3 Foundation. Uh, and yeah, and, and to be able to uh, participate in the auctions, if you don't have the capital to, to you know, fund yourself uh, and bid uh, like the best bid, you can always use the crowd loan functionality that comes with the Polkadot relay chain. Um, so this is like a trustless way in which like any dot holder or Kusama holder can can support their favorite project and and you know get get the promised rewards and and most importantly that the tokens that they are going to lend to these teams so they still sit on the relay chain uh, and once this lot ex ex expires the the tokens are returned back trustlessly okay so the tokens don't uh, belong to to the parachain teams they they still belong to you you're just lending them on the relay chain and you're going to get back get them back after the end of the slot so this is all done in an automated and trustless way and and yeah yeah so i'd like to end end, end this talk by my version of this talk uh, by giving you this note so it, it's not required that you become a parachain or a para thread to to take part in, in Polkadot ecosystem. You can focus on the parachains that, that offer, uh, you know, you, an opportunity to, to build an application on top of them, uh, mostly through like smart contracts. Uh, so there are, you can check the parachains that are already live on Kusama. They all let you like build, build the projects on top of them. So you again, have, have access to all the blockchains that are running on, on the ecosystem through them, okay? Um, and yeah, so uh, going into a uh, little more technical details, if you're interested in, in the way Polkadot and Kosama achieve like their finality, uh, you know, their consensus on what transactions need to be put on the blockchain, um, here are a few slides for you. Uh, we use a hybrid model, you know, finality uh, is, is, is an important thing for any blockchain uh, design. So classical blockchain, you know, like, like Bitcoin, uh, it uses, um, you know, the Nakamoto consensus where uh, you become sure that, that a particular transaction is final as more and more blocks keep getting added on top of the chain, right? So, so the more blocks you have, the more probability that the transaction is going to be final. On the other hand, you have like Tendermint style, you know, finality where you know, the block gets created, the block is final. So uh, each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. So, so that's why like Polkadot uses a hybrid model. Uh, we have like two, two uh, independent processes running to, uh, for the block production. So validators blindly like, you know, validate the blocks and, and try to keep adding them on top of the blockchain. Uh, and then there is a finality gadget that is going to finalize those, those blocks together and, and create them uh, in a sequence, okay? So it looks like this. So we have this finalized uh, chain. The finality gadget is going to pick one of these and then say, this block is the final one and, and the other ones have to be you know, included like, like later on. Um, take a look at the Wiki uh, documentation. Feel free to reach out to me after the talk. I'll be happy to go in depth about this topic as well. Um, what next? Uh, so this is actually happening like right now, uh, like I mentioned, uh, 10 slots, sorry. Uh, there are five slots that are open for, for auction. Uh, the parachain auctions on Kusama started on September 1st. They're going to uh, go till like the end of end of this month. Uh, so feel free to like check, check that out and Right now, these are the parachains that are live on, on Kusama network. And yeah, right now, these are the teams that, that are participating in, in the parachain auctions to get those like five slots. Uh, but yeah, so stay tuned. Uh, this is September and in Polkadot will go live with parachains once these two things are completed. We want the code that that's going to be ported to Polkadot to be fully audited so that there are no, no glitches or no security issues. And, and you know, Kusama hosts parachain. So this 
is already done. So once the audits are completed, that's when we'll, we'll launch uh, parachains on like a stable uh, network of Polkadot. So if you're interested, there is also a report uh, that you can go through that talks about the network stability when five parachains have been like online on the Kusama relay chain, okay? Uh, and the future upgrades, like I mentioned, uh, there'll be improvements in terms of how parachains communicate with each other. And there will also be a provision for a parachain to become a parathread and, you know, still have access to the full security features offered by the network. Now, if you're curious to, to know whatever I mentioned, how, how it works, uh, that's when, uh, you know, uh, Sacha is going to uh, give that overview to you. And I'm going to ask, uh, so do I take the questions now or do we take them at the end of the talk? Why don't you take the question now so that it's, you know, it's still relevant to the slides you're showing in case the person needed to go back and... and yeah, that totally uh, makes sense. So yeah. let's see. If govern, in governance, if someone suggests runtime upgrade, how voters know that the suggested code upgrade is the same as its description in proposal? I mean, why someone can't try to... Yeah, so so that's why we have hashes, right? So, so whatever code they... Uh, they want to like put put on the network. It, it's associated with a hash. Anybody can can verify that you know that's the code that is being being voted on. Uh, Sacha, you have something to add on top of it? Yeah, I, I think that's the best answer. That's the best answer because it's it, it's covering the technical aspect of how it really works. But there's also a social aspect that's kind of also really cool, which is just the, the way that uh, people talk about doing code updates uh, in in forums on, you know, you know, someone like has an idea and then writes on, as a referendum, you know, stakes and dot, for example. And then there's also, so a bit more complexity involved that Red Hat, I think, uh, you know, for, for the sake of keeping things kind of simple, we didn't, we didn't really go through, but essentially the way that governance works, it has several uh, council, council groups, committees, right? And there's a special, special committee that um, is the one that, that that has more weight when they vote on doing like big serious runtime upgrades runtime upgrades that really will change storage items in in the blockchain's uh, source code um that that like you know say if i want to just change the uh the some other like more like like surface level thing i i don't know an example off my head now but i wouldn't need to go through the approval of the technical committee of the polka dot chain to do that so there are lots of like, there's lots of uh, safety measures to kind of on, on a social level to, to, to mitigate against these types of risks. Right, so we have a follow-up question. So uh, it says, uh, if for some reason runtime upgrade breaks, uh, we are stuck with that, that block, right? So, so how exactly are we going to handle that, that issue? So especially when broken runtime upgrade block is finalized, uh, what do we do? you you uh, it doesn't happen <laughs> because you test and you do uh, storage migrations uh, in a testing kind of environment first um, and you really make sure that everything's okay when you actually do your runtime upgrade on a live production chain right so uh, as i mentioned earlier in my talk like we have these test nets which pretty much run the same code as as the you know actual chain so if something breaks, we wouldn't even like propose it or, or put that as, as a, a runtime upgrade in, in the first place. So we're going to do that, that testing right before, make sure everything works. And then we're going to, um, you know, put it on, to, on top of like Kusama, test it out and then go to like Polkadot. Uh, and saying that, like uh, if, if you're following the ecosystem, uh, there have been few few issues that cropped up after Parachain's launch on, on Kusama. Uh, so if you're interested, I, I just gave you a snapshot of that network stability report. Uh, check that. It talks about the finality, you know, stalling issue on Kusama that happened. And, and there is also a linked issue uh, that is diving deep into why this may have happened. But the network has its safety checks, so it didn't actually like stall the entire blockchain it only slowed the finality uh, you know by a few blocks if you think about it okay so i'll, I'll hand over the uh, you know talk to sacha please go ahead 
and explain the technical aspects of of you know Polkadot. Cool. Thank you. So I, I may as well just share my screen so that I can control the thing. Rather, if you want to just take off your sharing, yeah, cool. Okay. And this time I'm going to share um, the tab so I can find it. Yeah, this one. Um, can you see my full screen or is it also still like before? Yeah, that's okay. Like I see the, the slides. Um, it, it shows that in a browser, but, but yeah, uh, okay. it's, it's much better it's now. Yeah. Okay, cool. <clears throat> okay. So, um, well, hi everyone. Uh, it's kind of weird, like not to, to see anyone or, you know, be interacting. I usually like to, to do these kinds of presentations where we stop and do questions and stuff, but um, super, super glad that you guys are here. I see there's a bunch of you. Thanks a lot, Radha, for also your, your portion of the presentation. Um, like Radha said, now we're going into like the more technical side of, of, um, of these types of systems that, that Radha was describing, Polkadot being the, uh, the Polkadot being really the, the, the main, the, the main system, the, the architecture that enables um, the, the vision for Web3, really. And, and our vision for Web3, I guess. So real quick, um, my name is Sasha Lansky. I'm developer advocate. So what's a developer advocate? Uh, well, I have a computer science degree um, and I like to teach other people how to use technologies. And um, I, would, I would identify myself as a tinkerer in this blockchain space. You know, you have like, you know, hardcore developers and middle ground and people that like to just play around with things. I'm, I'm more of a tinkerer. I like to, use tools, discover tools, and also uh, help other people make use of technologies. So what are my goals today? My goals are to prepare you to build with Substrate. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to, uh, we're going to start by giving high level of overview before we get into the nitty gritty of what building with Substrate looks like. Uh, I'll say one, one last thing before I kind of get going with this presentation. I try to make my slides uh, such that there's lots of links in them. And I believe that Anastasia will give you a copy of our slide deck and you can click on the links and, uh, you know, use, you, uh, you know, in case you're curious, basically that there's more information that you will find as URLs on our, on the links. So let's see. Um, Okay, so um, I'm a developer advocate at Parity Technologies. Parity Technologies is uh, the company that I work for. And I, I just thought it's, an, it's important to just give a brief overview of, of who we are and what we do. So I'd like to start with the fact that um, so Parity came out of the, 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 the wake of you know, innovation with Ethereum and the blockchain space really growing circa 2015, um, formerly known as ETH Core, uh, which was uh, the first um, 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 Ethereum and Bitcoin implementation written in Rust. And also uh, one of the, the, the most popular projects was ETH Go, which was the uh, Golang uh, implementation. So the other thing is that it was uh, Parity Technologies from the ETH core was founded by Dr. Gavin Wood. And I like to mention that in the context of the fact that the, our founders and, and the vision that we're trying to paint and the future that we're trying to build uh, really comes from the people that were already struggling with problems that a lot of these previous technologies uh, were, were, were revealing really. And so, um, uh, Gavin wrote the technical specifications or the yellow paper for Ethereum and you know, also started seeing the limitations and where Ethereum was really lacking when, when he came and, and uh, cre uh, created the, the, the vision for Polkadot. So we are a company of blockchain engineers. Um, 
as Rada says, we, we are the creators of the Polkadot network, working hand in hand with Web3. Um, I, I, I would like to rephrase that. It's not technically correct because we are just software engineers who are building the, the, the blocks that, that uh, the foundations for Polkadot. However, Polkadot is you know, open source and it's free, but we really are shepherding the engineering force there along with Web3 research. So a lot of the hardcore cryptographic research comes that, that we use it, we use Web3's research that, that is typically very heavy lifting stuff, most notably the uh, consensus mechanisms and stuff that uh, Substrate uses. And last but not least, um, we are open source. I checked and we have about 5.6 thousand GitHub stars and 1.6 thousand forks. That's a, that's, that's a pretty nice number for us being um, sort of uh, only really more and more popular over the last two years, I would say. And um, we are licensed under Apache 2.0, which gives us a, a fair advantage over other licenses uh, that enable developers to really share the code and reuse code without needing to worry too much about um, patents and stuff like that. So what's the plan for today? Um, I wanna talk about what is Substrate on a high level. So we've had, we, we've had this, the first part of our presentation went into what Polkadot is, the architecture of Polkadot. Well, we're gonna really narrow into like, what are these components that can make Polkadot-like chains? We're generalizing the thing. We're taking a, a, a view on the Polkadot uh, uh, blockchain as Rad had described, but really going into, okay, what are these key components? So the second, the, my, after going kind of high level, we're gonna talk about what these technical components are. What are these, what, what tools are we using? And then this is after all, uh, primarily a Rust audience. So I wanted to touch on how Substrate and Rust, you know, really are compatible and, and why using Rust makes for um, uh, the a perfect tool to, or programming language to enable the, the technical vision that we have for Substrate. And last, I will uh, touch on uh, tools that you can use. Uh, how can you get started with using Substrate and building Substrate-like chains? So on a high level, Substrate is a flexible, extensible framework for building blockchain. It's, it's very important that when, when you think about what Substrate is, it's not um, a platform to create decentralized applications. It's not uh, an easy way to make a DAP uh, or um, some kind of like, you know, surface level, high level application that can interact with Web3 applications. Substrate is a, is a framework for building blockchains. This means that it is very complex. Um, it, is, it is built to really uh, uh, to, to address the, the, the design decisions and, uh, and aspirations of developers who really know what they're doing with building blockchains. So the three key features at a high level that I've identified that I think is, is, is a very good starting point to think about how can you build the substrate, but also what are the design decisions that make you be able to make the most of substrate. So substrate is modular. It means that substrate can give you, um, it, can, it, 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 is, it is designed such that we can swap out bits and pieces and add on bits and pieces without it breaking the whole system. So for example, we'll go more into detail, but um, currently we are using uh, the consensus mechanisms that's been developed by Web3. Uh, namely brand, get grandpa and aura finan finality gadgets for consensus well you know if one day we decide that we want to completely change our consensus for a substrate node well we can swap it out with something else it's dynamic um i'm going to also touch on this in our later slides but this means that on a state transition function level we have a lot of flexibility and it's adaptable we talked a bit about adaptability uh, adapting to change, so runtime upgrades and, and et cetera. But I think that, that thinking of substrate as adaptable um, 
helps developers maybe really make the most of, of, of future proofing their chains or at least creating the foundations to adapt in the future. Substrate allows blockchain developers to build domain specific applications. Um, so um, domain specific chains, uh, what, what we mean here is that with Substrate, we have, we've, we've designed a framework to make it very easy for, de for developers to not worry so much about the, the hardcore uh, primitive layers that, that define blockchain technology itself, because that comes out of the box. We'll see later on how um, we have what we call the Substrate node template, which is essentially a skeleton blockchain that allows developers to quickly create a, a, a node and, and then build on top of it. So what we're really focusing here is, or what we're really enabling developers to focus on is their uh, blockchain business logic for their specific applications. Um, we're gonna get back to this slide and I know I've said that already three times, but we're high level here. So I just kind of wanna give you pieces to chew on as we continue. But Substrate is built with, really, with a lot of flexibility in mind, not only from a design principle and architecture point of view, but really from the, um, from the ability of developers to choose kind of where in the, in the framework um, they, they are most comfortable tinkering with, if that makes sense. This slide showcases how Substrate is really um, giving developers the opportunity to tweak the core nitty gritty stuff, which gives them more technical freedom. And also at the same time, uh, giving developers the ability to tweak on more of the, the node and applic business application level side, which gives them more development ease. The trade-off between technical freedom and develop development ease is really up to the types of engineers working with Substrate. So what are the key technical components of Substrate? Um, there's three of them. There's, the Substrate is based on three core technologies. The first is libp2p. Libp2p is a, a, a peer-to-peer networking layer that Substrate uses. This means that Substrate-based blockchains out of the box use libp2p for their networking layer. It's the Rust implementation of libp2p. Um, you know, at Parity Technologies, we're very, we're very much of this mindset that we don't need to reinvent the wheel for really good tech that already exists. Why would we do that? We have great technologies, why don't we use them? What, what, WebAssembly is another one of those. So WebAssembly constitutes as the second you know, core technology that sub, a substrate node uses. And um, this gives the, the types of features that make substrate nodes very special in my opinion. And Rada talked about this in his slides, the, the notion of, of upgrading your runtime uh, or, 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 or creating, um, basically compiling your runtime to Wasm, to a Wasm blob makes you uh, leverage WebAssembly in ways that you could, you could use them straight from the browser. You could be running a substrate, uh, substrate chain straight from your browser, or you could be querying that, that Wasm blob with tools that allow you to quickly make sense of what's happening in the uh, runtime that, that of a running chain. The third core technology is GrandPak Consensus. It's a finality gadget that was developed by the Web3 Foundation that makes such that um, every substrate node out of the box has built in uh, this, this very important built in core blockchain capability, which is finality, block finality. Um, so I put the two little uh, notes of, of, of from the high level, which is adaptable and modular. Any of these can be swapped out. If one day we decide that lib P2P is, isn't really doing it for us and there's a better technology out there, well, 
uh, let's 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 just replace it. Um, I think that that this is a core feature of of how we build Substrate too. So, at the very heart of a Substrate node is this. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, it's, it's a diagram that represents pretty much the components of a substrate node. So you have your, your runtime and your block execution. Um, the key value database is based on rocks DB. Again, another, another uh, community, uh, uh, another project, open source project that we are using to do all of this, the key value storage of, of any substrate chain. And then we have the runtime, which compiles the WASM. So the runtime is the, the really the, the heart of, of the substrate node. It's where all the business logic lives. It's, it's arguably the most important part of the blockchain, uh, of the substrate-based blockchain. We have our RPC server capabilities, a transaction pool, um, and the, the libp2p networking layer, of course, enabling peer-to-peer -peer interactions with, uh, with clients um, and, and consensus also, very important piece. Uh, like I said, kind of, you know, every, every single piece in this diagram that you're looking at is doing its job and um, the substrate node is really built modularly. This is, this is what I'm trying to, trying to show here. So again, for t key technical components, um, the runtime is the, the most important thing. I, I'm repeating myself. The, the runtime really encapsulates the business logic of your substrate chain. And so it's, it's, like, it's really like in, in other blockchain systems, it's the state transition function, right? It defines the possible state transitions and APIs around them. Um, it also encapsulates the storage persistence of uh, your blockchain. So, you know, you create uh, a storage instance for uh, maintaining the amount of, of uh, 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 the balance of your blockchain. Well, this, uh, the, the runtime and, and, and the storage layers are very tightly coupled. And uh, the upgradability also happens in the runtime because the runtime compiles the WASM, right? So with, with this capability, we can encapsulate all the business logic of, of, of possibly an endless, endlessly complex chain um, and still have the entire business logic in, in, a, in some bytecode. The definition of the runtime is also an element in storage. So we, 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 you know, we, Substrate by design really is trying to, to, to strip away any, any unnecessary, um, you know, maybe potential layer of friction or, or uh, unnecessary uh, uh, logic that, that doesn't really fit with um, um, like a clean design. You know, we're really trying to design things. And so the last thing on, uh, from the high level we said is, is that it's dynamic. So this really, this really defines the word of, um, uh, this is a very defining word for the runtime itself, because within the runtime, we'll talk about this in the next slide, we have this thing called palettes. And so every single palette defines its own business logic, specialized for what it's, the, the, the type that it needs. Um, and uh, we can swap these pallets out, right? So we can, we can do runtime upgrades that uh, from one block to the next, we have you know, some pallets that are, it's a runtime that is very simple things, such as it only does uh, balances and transactions. And then the next runtime, we can maybe swap out the balances because we have this new cooler way to do balances and then upgrade the chain with a new runtime that has additional functionality for balances. So you may have heard me say the word pallets. Pallets, what are pallets? Pallets are this really, really cool fundamental building tool to create business uh, um, or application logic in our runtime. So 
the, the, a, a palette is for you for rest developers you, you'd understand more that we, we we're talking about modules right when we're when we're compiling crates it's really just a bunch of modules put together that um that are like apis for our our application with in substrate we essentially palettes are modules but we call them palettes because we we, we we've made them special we made them we made, we made them special in the sense that like they they use macros in such a way that it makes it easy to develop application logic that that can fit into a substrate runtime um, it makes them also very composable so palettes can interact with each other uh, by a concept called tight and loose coupling um, a, a frame palette is uh, gives the gives the capability to handle events and errors that can talk directly to a runtime and also um, give the create dispatchable calls. So yes, yeah, so the sub substrate runtimes are made of a collection of Rust modules we call palettes, and you can think of it as um, sort of the, the 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 ease of development side of building with substrate. Palettes make it very easy to make use of these really complex low-level libraries. This is just a diagram that kind of shows what's in a tip, what could be in a runtime. Um, the 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 key ones are so Aura, the the Grandpa. These are you know the consensus palettes. Um, the asset palettes in here. The treasury is also in here. These are basically you know they're standalone modules that are aggregated in the runtime. This is why we call frame. Frame stands for the framework for runtime aggregation of modularized entities. So substrate and Rust. Um, you, we are a primarily Rust audience here, and I wanted to, to lean in a little on how we use substrate, uh, how we use Rust for substrate, and how Rust could be considered a very important uh, design decision in, in building substrate from the ground up. Now, I wasn't there when the when the first uh, modules were created uh, in Substrate. I, I also want to preface this with this is kind of my view on using this language to to the to the to the most to maximize the development experience that uh, Substrate wants to provide their developers. So the, the the two things that I will talk about is the crates and modules, um, and then uh, macros. And other things that the Rust programming language provides is the, I mean, you know, obvious traits of, of Rust characteristics is there the type safety mechanism. So Rust is, Rust is designed in such a way that it's hard to write incorrect programs. You, you probably have experienced that in your own development. Um, the Rust compiler, Will not be happy uh, as soon as it's like tiny bit not happy. It's not gonna just pass on a, a tiny bit of unhappiness and let you go like other languages would do. So the, the type safety really makes it uh, crucial for building blockchains. You know, we're, let's remind ourselves we're not building some sort of like game web at web two point web two application. You know, we're building critical systems. We're building. Um, infrastructure for people to exchange valuable assets so we, we can't we can't afford any failure uh, it's cross-platform rust is really great because it, it allows you to to, to compile to what well, wasn't and we talked about that but it also allows you to compile and uh, uh, run rust on a wide range of platforms uh, and operating systems i mean and uh, the cargo CLI, that's, this is kind of my, uh, cargo is actually, cargo is a very powerful tool that, that Rust provides us with. It helps us manage all of, our, all of the dependencies in a, the substrate framework, um, but it also gives things like cargo doc. You can, you can generate documentation um, very easily with, with cargo you can run tests with Cargo, very useful tool also. And the last point here I have is community. 
the, uh, the, the Rust community is um, very like, you know, cutting edge, they are, they, they're developing uh, really cool stuff. The, there's a growing community around the core Rust developers developing really cool stuff. And I think that this makes it an attractive language to be building with. So we 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 uh, brushed on the, this the 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 idea that um, that uh, substrate is really made of a bunch of different modules and crates uh, where you have like the more primitive types and then you know you have you have the, the palettes that we briefly discussed. So this slide kind of encapsulates exactly that, and and I tried to frame it uh, no pun pun intended, but the way I'm trying to frame this is is in the context of Rust crates and modules. So substrate literally is a, is what you're seeing here is not even half of it. Um, if you go to our Rust docs, and I've I've uh, linked every single one of these um, uh, the, these links, you can actually go click on them, and then you'll see the relevant Rust docs from crates.io. Um, well. You, you'll find that this is this is how substrate is built. This is substrate under the bonnet. So on the left here, we have the shareable substrate types and primitives. So this is things like um, hash uh, or uh, or unsigned integers. Um, like really like these like core on an underlying primitive types that then are used throughout the development cycle of a uh, substrate chain. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, I, but I invite you to check it out because it's very interesting how substrate is, is built. Then, then in, in the, the, the second column here, we have the client capabilities. So this is things like Boasm execution. Um, the consensus stuff happens on this, on this layer. And um, uh, again, a lot, of, a lot of complexity, a lot of libraries that you can go and see yourself. And this also leans to the fact of modularity right you could also write your own if you wanted to get to that level you could go and write your own consensus see how maybe the, the, the engineers at parity did it and see um maybe what it would look like to write your own consensus gadget instead of aura then this the the, the third column here frame so frame is this way to to make the blockchain development with Substrate easier, it's it's really it's really like this. F for me, as a, a tinkerer in this blockchain space, I um, I am thankful that Frame exists because it would be very difficult for me to make use of the the more primitive kind of columns one and two without something like Frame. So it it allows uh, developers to make it easier to build Substrate runtimes essentially. And uh, with Frame, we have palettes. So we, we can build this the modular pieces of code that are specific business logics for a runtime. And that's really cool. That's very powerful because we, we can build these palettes, but with macros, which we'll go into the next slide, we are able to make use of these hardcore primitives that uh, the substrate libraries provide us with. So back to this slide, right? Because we're really, we, 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 I'm trying to paint this picture where we, we have this thing called substrate that at the high level, it's, it's, it's a framework to build blockchains, but it's not just like, oh, uh, out of the box, you know, uh, uh, like a car cargo uh, release and then you, uh, cargo build release and then your, your chain is running. Um, Boom, that's it. No, like we can we can go in at, at a high at a very low level if we wanted to, right? Go into the core of substrate and tweak things and then and you know maybe optimize for our use cases. Remember, we're building domain specific applications. So so sometimes we maybe we need to be accounting for, for things that aren't just on the on the governance palette level, but maybe they're on on the on the, the client facing side or they are on um, uh, consensus mechanisms that are more pertinent to our use cases. So the development ease, however, is where you know Frame comes in, building palettes, which is also a great uh, attribute. So Frame, so how does it work? Um, 
frame this this diagram makes a good job i think at, at depicting how frame really is this interface between the runtime and all of these uh blockchain things right these blockchain things what are they they're the they're the ability to emit events outside of the chain they're the ability to make storage reads and writes the ability to emit errors also um, the ability to, to expose public APIs, RPC calls and stuff, um, and the ability to make transactions. We call them dispatchables, um, which really are, can be encapsulated by this term called in extrinsics. This is anything that is making some call from outside of the chain, the outside of the runtime really. So the configuration trait in a frame palette allows you to define the, the types and, and traits that your palette needs. Um, the, the, the storage and events and errors is uh, out of the box using frame macros. We can, def we can use these in our palettes to also define these capabilities. And uh, dispatchables are really like when one is making a transaction, that's the most common dispatchable. And I'll let you read more about what other dispatchables exist because there's some very interesting capabilities and ways of thinking of what they, those could be uh, that we do in Substrate that, that I haven't seen in other uh, development uh, frameworks. So a little macros now. Um, macros are really cool. Like macros are really cool, but really annoying sometimes, right? Um, uh, this is why I put this tip here. You can use cargo expand to see kind of what's happening, what 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 your modules are using under the bonnet. And um, on the on on the, the advantages of macros at a high level, it it ironically it makes the development experience much better. It really enhances the development experience because we're able to um, abstract out all of this nitty gritty stuff and make such that you're just writing Rust code, you're not writing uh, substrate primitives in every single palette. Your, your, your logic and the, your, the, the logic you're trying to encapsulate in your palettes can really be just that. And you don't need to worry about bringing in these other core library interfaces. So we have a bunch of um, attribute macros that we use for this and we also use derive macros. I've put links here too, you can check them out. And uh, procedural macros. So the runtime, for example, is using procedural macros where we just um, where, where we just define all of our palettes and the procedural macro uh, basically puts them together and that's what gets compiled to, to Wasm. So if you have a tiny bit of time at the end, I'm gonna actually show you a node and uh, that'll be really cool. This will make much more sense. So some substrate capabilities. I'm gonna skip through this slide. I want you um, who I'm assuming, you know, not a lot of you have lots of experience with substrate. Maybe it's the first time you're, you're, you're hearing about substrate. You, you should check out what these capabilities can give you um, in the light of how can we design cool things, right? Well, how, what are these tools that, that are at our disposal, right? We, we have tools such that we can now uh, easily read all of this metadata stuff that's happening in a node. Uh, we have origins, origins help for governance. How can we design our governance systems on a blockchain infrastructure level? Um, and uh, off-chain features also um, are, are just uh, Oracle-like capabilities that, that comes out of the box with developing with Substrate. So um, other tools like what, what what is there? Like, if you wanted to get started with Substrate, where would you go? Um, and essentially, the node template. The, 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 the reason I skipped through this slide is because I want to just first talk about where would you go if you wanted to learn more about Substrate, and then kind of go into um, sort of like second layer stuff. So the node template is an out of the box, fully functional blockchain. And you know what? We have, we have some time. So I'm going to show you right now what this looks like. Um, in a project. Uh, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna quit sharing my screen and then share my VS Code screen, one second. Um, 
and then we'll check it out. Okay, so can you see my can you see my uh, VS Code right now? Yeah, cool. Okay, so real quick, um, so we talked about palettes. Um, up, so this this is a substrate node template. So it comes with um, all of these basic capabilities to run a, a substrate node out of the box. So right now, um, if we have a look at the run the construct runtime macro, which is the macro that is that is compile that is compiling all of these subs the, all of these palettes. So you can see that this node uses the system the system library. So it's it's a palette that um, that provides all the basic stuff that we need for a, a substrate node to run. And random collectives, I you know there's there's not that many, but here's Grandpa for example, the Grandpa uh, and Aura capabilities. These are all the palettes that are used right now in this in this node. And if you go to the Polkadot node, for example, you'll see there's a bunch more stuff. There's there's things for governance. There's things for um, sophisticated uh, asset stuff, like the assets palette is in there. Um, but here it's just basic stuff. It allows to transact and that's pretty much it. And here's the pseudo palette uh, and the template module. What's really cool is that this node comes with this template module. So the template module, um, and I'm gonna quickly just do a, a brief, like what are we looking at here? So there's the runtime. The runtime is where this the business application lives, right? This is it, like we're looking at it right here. Um, it, it's, it's down at line 274. That's because there's a ton of other stuff that's implementing the palettes. So how are we implementing um, the, the, the config for runtime, you know, from, from, from the, the, the system palette right here? And this is all of the, the primitive stuff like really coming into play. How do we define an account ID type, et cetera? Um, and, but as, 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 as someone who wants to maybe get started with just trying things out, um, you would pop, most likely go into the, um, the, no, the node template palette. So the, the, the template palette, I mean. So this template palette you can see has all of our, um, um, it, it has all of these like basic capabilities of using frame, making use of frame. So um, there's some documentation that I've linked on the slides, but essentially what we're looking at here is this macro that allows us to easily develop with Substrate by using um, all of these the, these attribute macros that um, that we're seeing right here. So for example, the storage here. Um, this is this is this generates storage, the runtime storage items. Uh, this this here palette event generates events and also metadata for that event. Uh, we also have the error here, right here. And uh, to this is this is the palette call is really where the, the extrinsics and dispatchables are happening. So this template palette doesn't do much. It just puts something in storage and emits an event, um, but it's really a great start to, to start uh, you know, tinkering with, with Substrate. I'm gonna get back to my slides now. Um, up. Um, oh no, oh yeah, here we are. Cool, okay, so the, so the no template, great start. Um, the front end template is also a great uh, way to just um, try out the, 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 the actual substrate node, but with a front end. So if you're more like on the React uh, DAP side, it's a great place to, 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 to try to, you know, develop like a, like a neat front end for substrate nodes. And it makes use of Polkadot.js API. Uh, oops. So, so, that's really that's these these two part these two templates are a great place to start. Then you have tutorials, how to guides, knowledge base. I won't go over each and every one of them, but it's it's pretty vanilla now. Like you know where you know knowledge base is reference for the stuff we're talking about. How to guides provide like easy way to kind of get going uh, with it, well more like 
Um, and I, um, if you're stuck on something, you can probably find a guy that will help you. And tutorials are a great like A to Z type thing. So just going back here. Now, what, 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 what would you do next? Like what's so what? Okay, you could kind of build, you can build your own palettes, your application logic, that's really cool. But what other tools are there for you? So I, I put these two here because they're really like great projects that Parity is working on. Um, so Cumulus, you can click on this link. It's a set of tools for writing substrate-based Polkadot power chains. So remember, we're, we spoke about uh, Polkadot and, and has these power chains and power threads and everything. Um, well, what's the what's the link? What's the connection, right? Okay, so Substrate can build Polkadot power chains, I guess. Well, yes, but it, it doesn't need to, right? You, you can create your own blockchain that doesn't need to be a power chain. You can do your you can be a standalone chain. Um, and you, it could be a private consortium chain, or it could be a public permissionless chain. The thing is, Polkadot, if you do choose to be a power chain, will give you these guarantees of security, pooled security, that doesn't exist nowadays, like to date. Maybe one day maybe there'll be other relay chains that, um, uh, that, 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 that other chains can uh, build and integrate with, but right now there isn't. So if you want to be building a substrate, uh, potentially parachain chain, Cumulus is a great playground for you because you will learn how to test it out, how to bring your chain to a sort of parachain environment. Ink, um, Ink here. So Ink is the programming language that is really just a bunch of super sophisticated use of macros to write smart contracts in Rust. And it's, it's really cool because Sure, smart contracts, you'd think, oh, you need like, you know, maybe it's an Ethereum smart contract, you need the EVM or um, uh, how would I do such smart contracts? Well, these smart contracts compile to Wasm. So it's really cool because more and more people now are working with, with um, you know, with Wasm and, and reading Wasm binaries that you can also, you can potentially integrate smart contracts with other chains that, that just can read Wasm. So, I uh, recommend that you do the contracts workshop. The contracts workshop will teach you how to integrate that palette into your runtime so that you can have a substrate node that runs uh, the, the capabilities to read and write smart contracts in Rust. Frontier. Frontier is the, the third one I put here because um, a lot of people come to substrate thinking, oh, how do I integrate with, with, with uh, Ethereum smart contracts? Well, Frontier is the Ethereum compatibility layer for uh, chains to inter interact with uh, the EVM. And so it comes with an EVM palette and an Ethereum contracts palette. And um, it really kind of gives the ability for any substrate chain to interact with Ethereum contracts. The thing is that y you're, you're probably better off like um, uh, adding or exploring as beginners to substrate I would recommend that you really explore this, the design space that Substrate gives you with the tools that are available to you. We, we're no longer just talking about smart contracts. We're talking about building sophisticated domain specific blockchains. And that means that you have access to all these levers that smart contracts is really the last uh, on the stack, right? So uh, this is just my advice, but Frontier is definitely very exciting technology that's happening um, and also being built by Parity. There's some more tools I put here. Um, if you are more into front end, check out the Polkadot.js API. So this is the ability, uh, well, it gives, allows developers to query a substrate node and interact with it using JavaScript. Um, and the front end template that I referenced earlier uses Polkadot.js API. There's other client libraries. So I invite you to click on that link. Client libraries such as uh, client substrate clients implemented in Go, in C Sharp, in C++ and in Python. Smalldot, Smalldot is, a, is a, also, it's a standalone repo in the Parity Tech organization where uh, we're building light clients. So we're really trying to make it easy for 
um, for people to host their own light clients and make use of their light clients. Uh, sub key is a cool way to, to generate uh, key pairs and a and, uh, sidecar. It's a Rust service that it makes it, it makes it easy to interact with blockchain nodes that are, are using the substrate uh, framework. Some other really some other cool tools basically that I, I invite you to come back to this slide maybe once you've already done a few tutorials because uh, you know for example SR tool SR tool is this great way to, to very easily see what's in a runtime and it doesn't need to be for just developers you could you could you could use this kind of tool to query a runtime so for example if you wanted to see what polkadot is made of you can um i mean i invite you to check out that repo but essentially by running sr tool on polkadot's runtime you can easily see every single uh, palette that it's made of and the associated metadata and some other ones, sub flood, for example, when you're testing a live network, uh, flood flood your node with as many transactions as possible. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I that that's kind of it for me today. Um, I I invite you to look back at these slides, click on the links. There's also some links in my in the speaker's notes that um, I'm happy for you to just you know check out. The next steps for me that I advise you is get started with some tutorials. Uh, that's the best way. Join us on Element. So we have a very active technical chat on uh, on Element, previously Matrix. Um, and people are there to help you. We have support engineers that are there like pretty much 24 seven. And uh, it's a great place to get involved with the community too. And the third thing is watch our sem seminars. They're also a great resource. Our seminars are bi-weekly where we just talk about substrate based things and um, uh, often we have like some nice projects that are uh, that are uh, presenting, and and it's and it's great to to hear from builders themselves, like what their pain points are, what their aha moments are, and, and it's it's a great place to, to learn from a different angle. And that's it. So, there is there is there any questions in the chat? I haven't really been keeping an eye. Yeah. So there are, I think, three questions that that were asked. Um, but yeah, cool. you can you can take them. Uh, okay. Now, so, like. um, I'm not sure I can see the questions actually. Okay, oh. I can I can read them out for you. If that's okay. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So I think the first question is about the learning curve for beginners, uh, mainly for the macros logic. You know. Uh, which can get quite complex uh, and also are there plans for optimizing the compile times uh yeah so first for to answer the first question um i i would argue that uh the use of macros previous to our our new upgrade of, of using attribute macros so this is what we call frame v2 well it used to be a lot worse it's getting a lot better and the reason I, I say that is because um, before the structure of a palette was very cumbersome and hard to follow. Now, at least, it's, it's, there's a very clear way to see the constituents of a single palette. And macros actually help that developer experience. They don't make it worse. Um, I think as a beginner developer, it, it might get very confusing as to what every single macro does. but. Uh, I never really know. I mean, I only need to know if there's something wrong and I'm not doing something right about it. Uh, but this is the, the beauty of it is that it, it abstracts everything so that it makes it easier to develop and not make you kind of think and try to understand everything. Right, I, I would also add to this. Uh, so S Substrate Dev has has a bunch of like tutorials and, and like, you know, how to guides. I think they watch out that space. A lot more like tutorials are going to be added to, you know, improve the learning curve of, of beginners. Yeah. All right. So the next question is, there also can be a problem with Rust tooling, like auto auto complete refactoring code navigation, etc. concerning code with a lot of macros. Is there a way you guys avoided developing with Substrate? Are there any plans to make this aspect more convenient? Um, so there's a couple of tools that I referenced here. Um, uh, no, it's this one, Cargo Expand. Uh, 
I, I don't know if this helps or answers your question in any way, but it, it, it could because it, Cargo Expand helps you see what's happening under the bonnet. So if you're if you're not sure as why you're maybe getting an error and, and what macros are involved, that's kind of like a, a great tool to, to see which macros are, are, are being utilized, which makes it then easier maybe to debug. Okay, and the last question is, is the idea of reworking system substrate core logic a good idea in case that it isn't what we want in our blockchain? For example, if someone wants to opt out of each transaction having nonce to avoid replay attacks, Ethereum approach for a UTXO scheme, is it a good idea to use substrate and modify system? Um, the short answer is, I don't know, because I've never done that. Okay. Um, and, and that, um, that if you have a good reason to do it, well, it's, it's your chain, right? You're not, when you're developing a substrate, you're not like, there's, you're not connected necessarily. Like you're not, uh, you're not connected to a relay chain already, you know? So, so what, what's the risk in trying, I guess would be my answer. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So substrate framework uh, lets you like build a blockchain and it, it need not like follow uh, like, you know, what Polkadot ecosystem, you know, specifies. So, so you can build your own blockchains using it. Uh, if, if you want to tweak something about that, I think people should be able to tweak it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's basically my point. Okay. Um... And concerning the compile times, are there any insights for that, for substrate development? I mean, I think the answer is always trying to do better, um, uh, but Rust is heavy itself. You know, Rust is a very heavy, uh, like compile intensive uh, language. So that's just what Rust is as a baseline. Now it's true that the substrate node contains a lot, a lot of crates, so it makes it um, makes it slow. But that's yeah, I think that's what we're working with. And we don't have that much control. And uh, I think if you're if you're working specifically on modules like pallets, uh, there is a way you can run only the pallet code, right? To compile that one instead of like compiling the whole whole thing again. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that true, Sasha? Like when you're a developer, uh, there are options where you can reduce the compile time uh, by focusing on on the specific palette. Yeah, yeah, yes. Like for sure, you don't you don't always need to build every time. Uh, and I, I think sometimes it could take up to thirty minutes when you first build a, a chain, and you don't need mm -hmm. to do that every time, which is nice. Right. Any other questions about Polkadot or Substrate? I will add that there, there was a UTXO implementation actually with Substrate. Um, I think you can find that easily if you Google Substrate UTXO parity. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of great, great questions. Thank you very much for asking. Yeah.